the next defendant had political beliefs that resonate in Britain to this day. Henry Martin was no man of God, but a suspected atheist and notorious womanizer. It was said that he would have preferred to command a regiment of whores rather than a regiment of horse. But he was also a Republican. He wanted England ruled not by kings, but by Parliament and the people. Henry Martin's republicanism provided the key that unlocked the legal framework that would kill a king. This is a true story taken from the original transcripts of the trial of the regicides, the king killers. My lord, here is one who sat and signed, a proud and insolent member of that high court of injustice. He did both sign and seal the document for summoning the court and the warrant for execution. He sat almost every day in judgment, and in particular the day of the sentence. And this we shall prove. My lord, I will not waste the court's time and deny the matter of fact that I sat and signed. But I would, by your leave, set aside the malice. <laughs> the indictment reads, I believe, maliciously, murderously, and traitorously. This I would set aside. Well, clearly he thinks a man may sentence a king to death innocently, charitably, and honestly. Because he would wipe off the malice, we shall prove that in all he was malicious and merry, and that he gave the foundation for that advice upon which they proceeded against the king. It was when the army brought his majesty to London for his trial, my lord, I and some other gentlemen resolved to discover their plans in the hope that we might attempt the king's escape. The prosecution produced Sir Purbeck Temple, ardent royalist and would-be Scarlet Pimpernel. By giving money, I was able to come near the painted chamber where their council met. I espied a hole in the wall under the hanging, and there I placed myself till their council came. After a prayer, they fell to debating the manner of trying the king when he should come before them. Even as they spoke, there came news that the king was landing at Sir Robert Cotton Stairs. Excuse me, sir. The king has arrived. At which Cromwell ran to a window, looking onto the king as he came up the garden. And as he looked, he turned as white as a wall. Well, my masters, he has come. And now we are doing that great work which the whole nation will be full of. Let us resolve here what answer we shall give the king when he comes before us. For the first question he will ask us will be this. By what authority do we try him? To this, none answered for a long while, until up spoke Henry Martin, the prisoner at the bar. Well, then let it be this. In the name of the Commons and Parliament assembled, and all the good people of England. Aye. Are we agreed? Aye. We yes. Agree. Come now. What matter is it to say, let it be acted by the good people of England, since we did all in the name of the commons assembled in Parliament? That was no Parliament, sir, but a mere fag end, a veritable rump of a Parliament. Aye, sir, and with corrupt maggots in it. 
Well, sir, if I have been misled on this, I think I am not alone. Indeed, my lord, I could say I see a great many faces here today that were once misled as well as myself. But this I will not insist upon, except to say this. He that gives obedience to the authority that is in being, I think he is of a peaceable disposition and very far from being a traitor. But Henry Martin was not the stuff martyrs are made of. Having reminded the court of these uncomfortable truths, he pleaded for clemency and was spared the death penalty. Jailed for the rest of his life, he took comfort in the thought that a king who had been restored by parliament was at least better than one appointed by God. If it were possible for the king's blood to be in his body again, I could wish it with all my heart, along with every drop that was shed in the late wars. I also judge his majesty that now is to be king upon the best title under heaven, for he was called in by Parliament being the representative body of England. And I shall pay obedience to him during my life, be it long or short. John Cook. Now at last, the time had come for the regicide's court to hear what happened when an English king was put on trial for treason. My lord, he that brought the axe from the tower is not more instrumental than this man. My lord, I would trouble the court for pen, ink and paper. Give it him, Mr. Clark. Thank you. John Cook was a man in love with the law. At Gray's Inn, where radical lawyers like him congregated, he was known for his ingenious legal arguments. In the aftermath of the Civil War, the question of whether it would be lawful to try the king was a burning issue. Cook tried out his daring arguments on his protege, Mr. Nutley. But surely, Mr. Cook, it is a maxim that the king can do no wrong. <laughs> By what law, then, can a king be condemned? Put the case, Mr. Nutley, of a man entrusted with a sword for the protection and preservation of his people. What, then, if this man employ that sword to their destruction? Well, by this, he declares himself to be an enemy to that people and deserves a most exemplary and severe punishment. This I would call the law of nature. Do you know the prisoner at the bar? Mr. Nutley found himself in the difficult position of being called to give evidence against his old friend. Truly, I knew the gentleman well. Indeed, sir. I owe my all to him, as he was pleased to do me and some others the favour to reason law with us at Gray's Inn. Surely then it is a great aggravation to his crime that he that knew the law so well should so much transgress it. Very well, Mr. Nutley, well, tell us, if you please, how this learned gentleman acted in the business against his king. The first day of bringing His Majesty to his trial was Saturday, January 20th, 1649. The King was brought up as a prisoner and put within the bar, and there was a kind of speech made by Mr. Bradshaw, who was then president of that court. Lord President, they called him. Mr. Bradshaw spoke to the King in this manner. I think I shall repeat the very words. Charles Stuart, present King of England. Charles Stuart present King of England, the Commons of England assembled in Parliament 
taking notice of the effusions of blood in the land, which is fixed on you as the author of it, and whereof you are guilty, have resolved to bring you to trial and to judgment. And for this cause, this tribunal is erected. It hadn't been easy to put together the legal team to take on the case of the people versus the King of England. John Cook only got the job of prosecutor when a more experienced lawyer dropped out on grounds of ill health. For Mr. Cook, it was a chance to put his daring theories into practice. The judge in the King's trial was John Bradshaw, an obscure barrister from the Northwest. London judges had made themselves scarce when Parliament cast around for someone to preside over its court. They knew a poisoned chalice when they saw one. Everything that followed turned upon the question of whether or not the king was above the law. The scene was set for a contest between two irreconcilable views of constitutional power. As this trial without precedent began, no one could predict which would prevail. My lord, on behalf of the commons of England and of all the people thereof, I do accuse Charles Stuart here, present of high treason, and high misdemeanours, and I do, in the name of the Commons of England, desire the charge may be read to him. It is charged that Charles Stuart, the present King of England, did engage in a wicked design to overthrow the rights and liberties of the people, and that he did traitorously and maliciously levy war against the Parliament and so the charge was read by Mr. Cook. The words were very strong, saying His Majesty was to blame for all and concluding that he was but a tyrant, traitor and murderer to the people, at which conclusion I did observe His Majesty to laugh somewhat. Sir, you have now heard the charge. The court expects your answer. I require to know by what authority, I mean lawful authority, I am called here. For there are many unlawful authorities, thieves, robbers by the highway, and in truth, I recognize not eight faces here. Justice! Justice, I say! Remember I am your king! Your lawful king. I have a trust imposed in me by God and will not betray it now to answer to this new unlawful authority. I ask again, by what authority am I called here? You must answer in the name of the people of England. Aye. 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 Of which you are elected king. Elected? No, sir, you are sorely mistaken in that. England was never an elected kingdom, but an hereditary kingdom for these near thousand years. But I tell you, I stand more for the liberty of my people than any that come as my pretended judges. Justice, I say! Justice! Silence! 
it in the court. Silence! There was still a chance that the axe man would not be called for. If the king had recognized the court's authority, he would also have acknowledged Parliament's authority, enough to satisfy at least some of his judges. But as the trial continued over a second and third day, it became clear that Charles would never concede. To break the stalemate, the court prepared to move straight to sentencing. I saw Mr. Cook once more on the third day at Gray's Inn, about Cook. 10 or 11 o'clock of the evening. Cook. I'm sorry to see you still up to the ears in this business. Mr. Nutley, I serve the people in this. I believe there is a thousand to one will not thank you. You will see strange things yet, sir. We must wait upon God. How can you treat a man as gracious as he is? Still, I pressed him, and he acknowledged to me that the king was as gracious and wise a prince as any was in the world, which made me reflect upon him again and ask how he could press those things as I had heard. There is only one course we can take. You have forced them into this no, corner. You know Finally, he spoke thus. It is the law. The king must die and the monarchy die with him. Boy. It was on the third day he urged that the king's refusal to plead be taken pro confesso. That is to say, as an admission of guilt. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Nutley. And what said His Majesty to this? As before, disputing their very right to try him. My Lord President, my humble motion is this, that the prisoner be directed to make a positive answer, either by way of confession or negation, which, if he refuse to do, it shall be taken pro confesso, and the court may proceed according to justice to sentencing. Well, sir, it's the liberty and freedom of the people of England that I stand for. If a power may alter the fundamental laws of the kingdom, then I do not know what subject he is in England that can be sure of his life or anything that he calls his you own. You must submit and deliver a punctual and direct answer to the charge. I will not. I require to know how the Commons of England became a court of judgment. It is not for prisoners to require. Sir, I am no ordinary prisoner. Show me the jurisdiction where reason cannot be heard. We show it to you here. The Commons of England. It is by this and by the good people of England that we shall have your plea and no more of your reasons. Tis false! Down with the whore! Oliver Cromwell is a traitor! Shoot them! Well, sir, remember that the king is not suffered to give the reasons for the liberty and freedom of his subjects. How great a friend you have been to the laws and liberties of the people. Let all England and the world judge. Good. In truth, my lord, there was no trial. You do not understand you, Mr. Cook. His Majesty would not plead, and therefore I say there was no trial. And have you anything else to offer? But twelve poor words, my lord. 
All I did was what was required of me by my profession. And I hope in this business that it appears I gave good and honest counsel. I did nothing but what I was required to do by my clients. I did not invent nor contrive anything. I spoke as they would have me speak, and when I spoke it, it was for my fee. Uh, this, my lord, you may call greed, but not, I think, malice. I hope you will think it no unkindness in me that I do now demand judgment against him, not for my fee, my lord, but because it is just. Well, I have done, my lord, except to humbly desire to acknowledge his majesty's favour that I was not put in irons. Had it been in some other kingdom, they would have served us as John the Baptist in prison. I thank you. I have had a fair trial. Thank you.